Hi everyone, this is Amy from the North Columbus Public Library, and today we have a special community guest speaker from Historic Westville. Her name is Chelsea, and she will be showing us a cooking demonstration with corn here in just a couple of minutes. I wanted to also invite you to check out some books that we have. Um, we have various cooking recipe books. The first one here is actually a print book that you can request for curbside pickup. It's called Jubilee, and it's by Tony Tipton Martin. Uh, Jubilee Recipes from Two Centuries of African American Cooking. It has uh, more than 100 recipes that paint a rich, varied picture of the true history of African American cooking from James Beard award-winning food writer. So please feel free to request this. And this is also kind of a new book. It just came out in 2019. Next, we have Corn. Uh, this is from the University of North Carolina Press by Tema Flanagan. And it's part of the Savor the South cookbook series. And this is actually an ebook that is uh, available through our Hoopla app. And remember that you can check out up to 20 titles or 20 different variations of movies and music and books uh, through the Hoopla app. Or if you prefer just to check it out through the website directly, you can do that too instead of downloading the app. So again, so this is a really uh, great book that you can check out. It has over 50 recipes um, demonstrating the use of corn and um, especially and how it's influential with uh, Southern cooking. Um, next, we have another book that's called Corn, and this is um, through Story Publishing, and it is by Owen Woodier, and this one has 140 recipes, roasted, creamed, simmered, and more, and so there's all kinds of different variations of corn that you can use when you are cooking. So again, this is actually through the Hoopla app as well, so this is an ebook that you can check out. And last but not least, we have The Cooking Gene, A Journey Through African American Culinary History in the Old South by Michael W. Twitty. And this is an ebook, and this is through the Libby Overdrive app. So uh, feel free to check that out too. And uh, this is a 2018 James Beard Foundation Book of the Year, and it also won the uh, uh, award winner in writing and he also received a nominee for the 2018 Hurston Wright Legacy Award in nonfiction and number 75 on Route 100 um, uh, in 2018. So uh, and, and Michael W. Twitty is a culinary historian who offers a fresh perspective on our most diverse cultural issues. So please feel free to check this out as well. And this is all related to our guest speaker, who's going to give us a very thorough and inspiring a demonstration and talk about cooking with corn. Thank you so much for joining me and stay tuned. And here's Chelsea from Historic Westville. I'm the museum manager at Historic Westville, which is a living history village in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, today I'm going to be doing a cooking demonstration. So I am in our kitchens in our McDonald House on site. We are a village that betrays uh, mainly 1840 to 1860. We're slowly expanding to uh, portray the entire 19th century, entire 1800s. And we have to see you sometime. Today I'm going to be using corn for a recipe. Corn was very important to the South during uh, the 19th century. Uh, corn was originally from the Americas. It was huge in Native American culture in this area. A common technique for Native Americans to grow corn was called the Three Sisters. So it was corn, beans, and squash that made up this trio. And they're all planted together because they grow really well. They all help each other grow. The corn stabilizes the beans and uh, the beans put nitrogen into the soil. And squash helps protect uh, the soil from getting weeds. So it was a very common method of growing. Today I'm going to be making something called corn pudding. This recipe comes from a recipe from a book that was created during your time period. 
It's called What Mrs. Fisher Knows About Old Southern Cooking. She was born in South Carolina to a French father and a black uh, South Carolina woman. So the odds are was that she was enslaved by her own father. And eventually uh, she grew up cooking on uh, this plantation. And by the time she wrote this book, she had about 35 years of experience. After emancipation, she and her husband moved out to California to San Francisco. Another important thing about Abby Fisher and her book is that it is one of, if not the only cookbook we have from an formerly enslaved person. So it's very important to the historical record because of this. She wrote this book in 1881. And so uh, what's interesting about this book is that she could not read or write. And so she dictated all of it. So even in some of the spellings, you can tell that they weren't used to Southern dialect. Um, just because the spellings at Sakatash is one of the ones that spelled very oddly, and so you have to kind of read it aloud to understand what they're trying to say. So first things first, I am cooking over a, an open hearth fire, and so this is a real fire. Um, I'm just waiting for the coals to die down first before actually cooking over it. Uh, you want the coals in order to have more of an even heat than over open flame. One of the things with this cooking method is that you have to really pay attention, become very involved with your food. You have to really, you can't just set a timer because the temperature is going to be different every single time. You really have to pay attention and look and feel and taste to see how things are cooked. Cooking in this method does take a little bit longer than it does today, uh, mainly because you have to, mainly because as it sits, the temperature you know drops so you're always constantly having to maintain that temperature so it does take a little bit longer it's a lot more labor intensive but it's i think it's really worth it it gets this really nice kind of almost smoky flavor and the long cooking especially with meat i think it just tastes just absolutely delicious i think the best chicken i've ever made was right here in this kitchen uh, over this fire um, for our christmas event i think it's the best thing i've ever made in my entire life so now I'm going to actually make the recipe. Here I have some corn. And I'm going to stoke our fire because I don't want it going down. Oxygen helps it kind of flame up. This is a very dangerous job. Um, long skirts, you know, you could, you could easily get burned catching fire. This was the number two cause of death after childbirth for women during her time period. As the period progressed, you get a lot more stoves, which are a lot safer, instead of cooking over direct flames. If you're super rural, you might still be cooking this by the end of the 1800s. Um, but as technology progressed, this became less used. So now I have two eggs that I'm going to mix into the corn. It's really hot in here. <laughs> and it is in the middle of summer, I'm still doing this. And if you lived in the 1800s and you were cooking, you would have to do this every day, no matter what time or day. Now I'm also going to add milk. I put some black peppercorns in here. And I am using motor pestle to smash them up. So I have ground pepper. Now what I'm going to do is, this is called hearth fire cooking, so I'm going to pull coals out of the fire and onto the hearth, which is this part sticking out right here. And I'm going to put it underneath the pan so it gets heat from the bottom, and then I'm going to put the top on once I put the mixture in and put coals on top so you get an even distribution of heat 
on both sides. And I put butter in my pan, so I'm gonna mix it around a little bit before, just make sure nothing sticks. Just sitting here, it's so hot that it's already starting to melt a little bit, which is good, which is what I need to do. gets my eyes going and it says to cook for about 10 minutes in the recipe uh, I have it so I'm going to check in about five minutes to see how it goes so at the beginning of the century cooking was done through oral tradition through the end you could learn about it and not only was cooking methods uh, more concrete but like things of like measurements if you look at older recipes it says like oh just put a wine glass full or uh, put a couple of teaspoons in it, things like that. It's not regulated at all, but by the end of the uh, century, uh, things become a lot more regulated in measurements when you're cooking. The 1820s saw a huge change in the way we ate. At the beginning, you would have one big meal in the middle of the day. You would have a small breakfast, probably like over the day before, same with your uh, supper, your evening meal. And that's because it would take so long to cook and it's so labor intensive. As industrialization came more widespread, you kind of to uh, go kind of more towards a normal, what we would call a normal work week with having, you know, three square days, your evening meal would take place after work at the end of the day, especially as cities began to boom. Uh, during this time, about half of people lived in cities, about half of people lived uh, rurally. So cities were starting to become very big during the 1800s. Native Americans are very influential in the ingredients we use. So corn, like I'm using today, uh, squash, tomatoes, those kind of things are so prevalent in Southern cooking. Beans, sweet potatoes, all of those come from the Americas and are completely influenced by Native Americans. And a lot of cooking techniques that are very Southern, we get from Africa. Uh, southern cooking, what we think of today as Southern cooking is very heavily influenced by Africa. And it's because during the slave trade, they were kidnapped, forced to come here, and they were forced to cook their enslavers food. And so while it was slightly influenced by European tastes, because that's who was eating a lot of it, the techniques and everything definitely come from Africa. In many slave narratives and diaries, you see different kind of registers of how, of what they were given to eat. It was not very much. Usually it was a set amount of cornmeal, and a set amount of bacon. And so uh, what's called a, a hoe cake or corn cake was really popular uh, among the enslaved. It's just basically cornmeal mixed with water and salt if you had it, and you just form it and put it over your fire to cook. And basically if you ran out of your ration for that week, it was kind of too bad. You don't get to eat the rest of the week. It was very, harsh and it was not very much food and it was not a wide range of food. Some people were allowed to have gardens so it does bring in some fruits and vegetables 
into the diet, but not all enslavers allowed that. If you're homesteading, you would use game and basically just eat whatever you could like, grow and make yourself. Bread was super popular. It was eaten with almost every meal. Definitely in the beginning of the century, corn-based and rye-based, things like that were very heavily used. And towards the end of the century, wheat started becoming used. Towards the end of the century, there is a huge desire for bread to be white. They had this very odd connection with a sense of uh, purity, and they just really wanted to look white. And so they would add things like alum to it to make it look uh, very white, but it makes it very dense, and it does not look good when you see it. I would prefer, you know, modern artisanal loaf compared to what they would prefer. They also did things like uh, put borax in milk in order to make it taste better if it spoiled, things like that. But that's highly poisonous, so please do not do that. <laughs> okay, so I think it's been about 10 minutes. So I am going to check and see if it's ready. And this is the finished corn pudding. It's basically scrambled eggs with corn is what it looks like to me. So that is my open hearth cooking demonstration. I hope you guys enjoyed it and learned something. We hope to see you here at Westville very soon. Please stay safe and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for watching. are springing into summer learning at the Chattahoochee Valley Libraries, and the program you just attended is one of the ways you can earn completions. Just go to cvlga.org and look for Spring into Summer Learning. You can register yourself and your family online, and then start reading and attending our online events. That's all you have to do. We're giving away weekly gift certificates, and every completion you make enters you into a grand prize drawing for tablets, games, gifts, and more. Remember, you have to register to win cvlga.org, and we'll see you online again real soon.